Okay, so the um, panelists are those who gave lectures today, and um, so I'm going to open it up to, to questions for any of the panelists on, on, on the topics that they, they spoke about today. Okay, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about political entrepreneurship, um, even if, uh, if that's something we could talk about. So if the firm is uh, a creation of the entrepreneur, um, what kind of role does the, uh, does a, would a political entrepreneur play within, I don't know, a market process? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, with, with a junior faculty member, with all that implies. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, a political entrepreneur is, is someone who has the, the um, characteristics of an entrepreneur, uh, but c can't really calculate, but ha has, the, has the ability to, to um, I, I don't remember the, 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 the thesis of the paper, actually. <laughs> but, but no, the, the, we, we, you know, our, our thesis was that, that the political entrepreneur could, you know, could forecast, could invest time, effort, and so on, could in a way compare the, the payoff from the politicians with, with the time invested and so on. And, 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 and there was a, a, a primitive feedback mechanism in the political process. Uh, but it, it's not the same kind of entrepreneurship. I talked about calculation today. The, the, there's no way to calculate, okay? So it's, it's really crude valuing of, of the return versus the, the cost. Um, but but it, is, it is something that, that could be, there, there are um, psychic profits, right? The difference between what you've, the value of what you've given up and, and what you've gotten that can be captured by the political entrepreneur in the political process. Yes. I had a question related to, uh, I'm sorry. I had a question related to um, Dr. Klein's um, lecture on monopoly. And um, Dr. Klein, you, you stated that uh, many of the artificial monopolies that we see are flown from government regulations, such as, say, patents or subsidies or whatever. And I was curious that as long as we have a state, given that they're all monopolies that are propped up by government regulation, um, now, well, we certainly want to remove the regulation benefiting them. Is there any room for government intervention to try and remove the artificial market share that they have gained? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting sort of political, political economy question. So let's say, for example, you have a, uh, the government gives a license to a private company to be the only provider of electricity, you know, in some community, as is, as is typically the case in the U.S., you know, so these are private companies with investors and, and owners, but they have an exclusive franchise on del delivering electricity in that area. You know, so let's say we agree that the ultimate solution to this problem would be to remove that artificial protection and allow free entry into the provision of electricity, let entrepreneurs figure out how to make that work. But if we can't do that, is the second best solution to let them charge whatever prices they want? or to regulate the prices and say they can't go above a certain level or otherwise, you know, mandate universal service or whatever it might be. I mean, I don't think that, um, I don't think praxeology gives us a, a clear answer to that, but we can certainly, you know, we can, we can describe how the situation might look. In other words, if we add an additional regulatory layer, we could say as long as we're giving you, as long as you have the exclusive uh, franchise, we're going to demand that you, you know, we're going to control your behavior in some way. But of course, that's also going to have secondary effects, right? There was a famous, in fact, there was a, a series of studies in the 1960s and 70s that the way utility companies were regulated on price, they had an incentive to overinvest in, in, in equipment and uh, a, a certain kinds of capacity because that was a way that they could legally earn a higher rate of return than what they could, you know, get from charging electricity. Plus, you've got now you've got a regulatory agency that's set up and empowered to do these things, subject to political pressures, subject to lobbying, and so forth. So, I mean, it's it's a complicated question. But yeah, I think 
it's not an unreasonable argument to say if you have monopoly privilege, you sh- you know you you can't then any restrictions on your behavior are not automatically a restriction on you know freedom in some sense or an interference with the free market. I think we'd have to look at that on a case by case basis. Yes. So I actually have two questions, one for Dr. Gordon and one for Dr. Salerno, and I'll ask Dr. Gordon's questions first. Uh, so earlier you mentioned uh, in the praxeology lecture, you talked about Rothbard's view on praxeology, and you mentioned specifically something where he did say that some of praxeology is based on the senses, but earlier you said that Mises's view um, and, and the view in general on proxology is that it's independent of our senses. It's something we can come to without prior experience. So it is, is this kind of Rothbard contradicting Mises or is, is it there more to it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, uh, that would be a contradiction if in fact that was what uh, Rothbard and Mises said, but that isn't what they said, uh, at least as I'm understanding it. Uh, What Mises thought is that there's, from the notion of action, we can derive certain, certain concepts from, we can explicate the notion of action, and then we can grasp, and this requires observation of the world, that the system of concepts applies to the actual world. And Rothbard thought that the concepts themselves are abstracted from the actual world so that it isn't that there's a concept or some sort of conceptual grid that are imposed on the world, but they're abstracted from the world. So that, at least the way I understand it, is the basic difference between them. Okay, I want to ask you to hold the second question because we have a limited amount of time and a lot of questions here. Um, Tam in the back. Uh, This is a question for um, Dr. Balin and Dr. Klein, um, whichever. Um, I remember it's either in one of your um, presentation, you talked about the need for market prices, how companies need market prices to make decisions. But I recently, some time ago, not recently, read um, David Koch's books where he talks about in his company, how he knows that certain services are important and useful, especially those parts of the business that are not necessarily profit-making, is that they sell their services, even within the company. So he can compare prices with prices outside to know if this is a decision that we should either keep using or or something that we should outsource. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Basically, you know, as accountant, an accounting department, they basically sell their accounting services to other parts of the business. What are your thoughts on on basically market prices within the firm? I mean, the short answer is that I think those are. Sorry, <laughs> it's kind of. I would I would think of that as more like a managerial technology. Right, so I mean, the calculation argument requires the ability to calculate for the entrepreneur requires the existence of objective market prices. There have to there has to be private property and competition for those prices to be established. But given that I'm, you know, operating a large entity, let's say in a market setting, I've still got to do some. You know, I've got to make a lot of decisions about. Uh, how to allocate my capital among these different branches or subdivisions or teams or project groups within the firm. How do I do that? Well, I could do that using my own conjectures. I could simply impose by fiat a kind of a structure, or I could set up some kind of an internal competition, like a, a tournament among employees. I mean, a lot of firms have, you know, employee of the month award to, to get employees to work harder to try to you know, ha- produce more output or get more sales or whatever. And I could certainly set up something that looks like a market. I could tell a sub- subunit that it has to bargain with this other subunit about how much it's willing to pay for its services as kind of a simulation 
Or I could, I don't know, maybe I do a computer simulation. I mean, these are all, I don't think economic theory tells us that one of these approaches is necessarily, necessarily preferred to another. They're just different managerial techniques that the uh, operators of a large enterprise might use to try to figure out how best to allocate resources inside the firm. Sure. So I think Rothbard, correct me if I'm wrong, talks about internal prices within the corporation in many economy and states. And he talks about how those prices <clears throat> are just a technology like that. They do not represent actual valuations, which means, well, they're, they're tokens, but they're made up. So you're still blind to what the market actually values those parts in the business as. Okay, gentleman right there at the second row at the end, yes. Hey, thank you, gentlemen, so much for your talks. I have a question for Salerno. Okay. Uh, during your talk on calculation uh, within socialism, yes. you ran a little. You ran out of time talking about the more sophisticated responses yeah. to socialism. Yes. Do you mind just kind of going over in a little bit more detail uh, some of the responses to some of those specifically when it comes to trying to use mathematics or computer modeling or uh, more popularly is the artificial intelligence? If you could just kind of go over a little bit of that. that well, uh, so there were there were two more sophisticated neoclassical. Um, objections uh, they were brought mainly by British economists who were trained in, in neoclassical theory but were, were socialists um, uh, well actually a Polish cops Oscar Lange uh, Abel Lerner and and there were a few others a, Dick, a guy named HD Dickinson but in, in any case so, so they came up with two solutions one was a mathematical solution in which you you you, um, you, you collect all the data um, necessary to, to form a system of simultaneous uh, supply and demand equations. And then you, you solve that and, and, and it spits out equilibrium quantities and equilibrium prices. And then there was the market socialist solution in which prices are arbitrarily set for various factors of production. If there's a surplus, you lower it. If there's a shortage, you, you raise it. So to make a long story short, Hayek and Robbins answered that by saying, well, with the mathematical solution, um, it's, it's extremely impractical to collect the data and to convey it to the director. And then you would have a, a long lag in, in, in trying to compute this. This is before electronic computers, if you could do it at all. Um, so then your, your calculations would be a day late or, or a month late and, and, a, and you know, dollar short. It wouldn't, would, wouldn't fly, it'd be very impractical. Uh, and Hayek went on to point out that market socialism had, the, had a problem of, uh, uh, of, of the, the, having people on the spot who had the knowledge. A lot of this knowledge was dispersed. So the prices that were formed by bidding under market socialism, um, where, where the prices were set by, by the planners and then changed. So Hayek said, well, how, how frequently would they be changed? And in any case, th those planners wouldn't have the, the prices that emerged would not be the same prices with the s same amount of information contained in them that they would be if entrepreneurs on the spot made those. So he said, you know, this is Im improbable. And, it, it, you know, he, he did admit that if one mind had all the knowledge um, in, in the economy, if it wasn't dispersed, they, they could in some sense come up with an equilibrium solution. Mises said this is all nonsense. Um, the equilibrium solution is a solution that has nothing, no bearing on the real world where we have disequilibrium, continual change. So Mises basically said the mathematical solution is completely irrelevant to a world of, of people that aren't robots and aren't doing the same things over and over again. And uh, he uh, said that regarding market socialism, this is children at play. Children making up a game because there's no investment. The, the investment is controlled by the state. So, and, and the state sets up the different firms and the industries, sets up the structure of the whole economy, and then tells these managers to play at setting prices or at, at adjusting prices or, or, or producing at prices that they set, and then they'll change the prices. This is just a game. So um, basically uh, what Rothbard had asked Mises at, at, some, at, at one point, um, what, at what point does an economy become socialist? Mises' answer was when you abolish the stock market. That's the market where firms are created, destroyed, merge, and so on. So, I mean, uh, thanks for asking that question because I finished my lecture just then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cheap trip to get <laughs> Yeah. Okay, th th this lady right here. Uh, my question is for Dr. Thornton. It's kind of a two-part question. So, um, I'm wondering what your opinion is on what you think would happen if... Uh, the United States did decide to legalize all drugs. Do you think that 
uh, Mexico and other um, Central American com or countries that uh, smuggle drugs into the United States would just create something new and synthetic? Or do you think it would have any effect on foreign relations, like, it, like if violence would occur or anything like that? Or do you think it would all just kind of go away, the smuggling and stuff like that? Well, if, if the United States legalized all drugs, um, Portugal has decriminalized all drugs, and they've actually seen their social indicator statistics improve. So the basic question is I'm not threatened by that or intimidated by that. I think it would be a wholly good thing except for the transition. Now, in terms of the U.S. doing it alone, uh, the issue here is that the U.S. has been leading the global war on drugs from the very beginning, along with Great Britain um, at the time. Um, they're the ones that wanted to superimpose the will of the United States and its foreign policy on all other countries. And ba back in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the drug problem and drug control was... The, the avenue which they saw that they could get the biggest bang uh, for the buck. And so the U.S. has been a leader and internationally and, and at the United Nations, and I think that if the U.S. backed down on the war on drugs, that most countries would go along with that. Uh, even the producing countries, they're not happy with the situation because they're getting all the negative so-called unintended consequences in their own economies and in their own political systems. So I think there's a lot of countries that would jump at the chance to follow the United States in a um, legalization of all drugs movement. Um, and I don't see anybody fighting back, uh, except for possibly those pesky Canadians, um, you know, ag against all that. So... It's a great question, and I think it's a it's um, an area of great great hope. Someone on this side, okay. This gentleman in the second row, right here. Thank you all for your lectures; they're all awesome. Uh, my question is directed at David, uh, Doctor <laughs> Gordon, and um, it's about how you went over briefly determinism. Now Mises was open to the idea, but I think assumed more of a free will or compatibilist worldview. And I was just wondering if Mises had any sort of pro-free will arguments against sort of the determinist claim, or if you had any arguments that you thought really gave free will a very strong case in the field of human action. Well, I think what Mises said was he didn't, uh, he thought that the determinist view couldn't be proved. It, uh, so he thought this was just speculation. So for at least free will is an ultimate given. Now this raises, which I didn't mention in the lecture, what does he mean by free will? Does he mean something like, put it in very uh, oversimplified form, does he mean something like uh, if we if we we can choose to do something if we choose if we had chosen otherwise something else would have happened how is if we had chosen otherwise to be taken there are various ways to take that uh, in in one way it doesn't go against determinism it would just be if we had chosen otherwise something else would have happened but it doesn't follow that we could have chosen otherwise. It's just if we had chosen otherwise, some something would have happened. And I don't think Mises committed himself uh, on this. He, I think he was sympathetic to a, that's called a compatibilist answer. I think he was sympathetic to that. Hayek explicitly took that position, this compatibilist position. Now, on arguments... Uh, for free will, one would be, it seems, given to us in our experience that we choose in a stronger sense than that. It's not just that uh, 
if we had chosen otherwise, we would have done something else, but that in fact, it's not the case that uh, it's, it's, we could have chosen otherwise, it's just if we had, we would have done something. So it, seem, it seems to us that we have free will in, a, in the stronger sense and absent any strong reasons not to accept what seems given to us, then we should accept that. Now, if you say, oh, but look, isn't determined, isn't the determinist uh, argument itself a strong reason for rejecting this uh, ordinary view? I would say, I don't think so. I don't think, in fact, that the determinists have given any real arguments for this view. It's certainly, uh, sometimes people mention that uh, appeal to various quantum phenomena and say, well, the quantum uh, physics isn't deterministic, but to me, that isn't the most, the most significant point. It is classical physics hasn't, isn't deterministic either. As a, uh, people think, sometimes said that it is, but in fact, it, it isn't, or at least uh, that would be involved rather uh, difficult issues to go into, but I don't think it's been shown that it is. So I don't think there's any reason to reject what's given to us in experience. And also, uh, it would seem that in our ordinary uh, uh, holding people morally responsible for things, our whole language of responsibility seems to depend on the notion that someone could have done otherwise in a strong sense of that term. So I think, uh, as I say, absent strong reasons to the contrary, we should accept that even the people who favor determinism will usually often admit that when we're acting, we act as if we had free will, but they claim this is just an illusion of our first person perspective, but I don't see why we should think of it as an illusion. So as I say, it's a very difficult issue, but those are at least a few things I would suggest. Okay, one more person on this side, then I'll go back to that side. Um, over there, uh, uh, yeah. So my question is for Dr. Byland and um, Dr. Newman. It's in regards to what entrepreneurs or management should do under artificial credit and like when facing a lot of overconsumption and malinvestment, malinvestment, like for instance, the housing market, like what does Austrian economics say when you see a huge housing price inflation? Should you continue um, getting a lot of like credit, hire really expensive employers, or save up your money until you see the market adjust itself? He said your name first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so practically that's pretty easy because it doesn't say we should do anything at all. Um, I mean, the other question, what kind of advice can I, as a praxeologist, give business owners? I would say invest like hell when the boom starts, get out before it turns into a bust. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's hard to expand much more on that. Uh, if, if, we, if, we had, if we had the answer to that, then I probably wouldn't be sitting on the stage. I would be in a big mansion somewhere. So like if I could perfectly time the market in such a way to make all the money during the boom and then exit right at the top, then then I, I wouldn't be here. So I, I don't think I don't I don't think that there there's nothing in economic theory that says exactly how to time those sorts of things because it's dependent on on all of the many complex variables that are in, like even the most complex AI like we were talking about with socialism wouldn't be able to boil it all down into something that says now exit. Now exit the market. Actually, on this side can I add now? something quickly? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Because when you're an entrepreneur, I mean, if investing in a boom means that the resources are pretty expensive, 
And since entrepreneurs are expecting them to go up too, prices have already increased, which means if you enter a started new business in a bust, things are actually on sale. So if you have a good idea and you imagine that there will be a market uh, opportunity for you, then starting a business during the bust is actually not a bad idea. But the problem with that is <laughs> if everybody knows that, like, so, so suppose everybody knew that, oh, everything is undervalued, then nothing would be undervalued. So l like I said, it, it's even, yeah, it's just impossible to time it because you don't know what other people know and what other people are expecting. Okay, I'll take one more question on that side. Oh, back there, the woman back there. Thank you. Um, I think Dr. Dr. Violin, sorry, <laughs> mentioned how uh, to many people, entrepreneurs at the very least, find uh, the concepts of Austrian economics fairly intuitive. And I would say in my personal experience, many more people than you would think find Austrian economics very correct in their own minds, even if they can't put words to it. For example, my mother, who's never had a day of economic education in her entire life, besides perhaps NPR, uh, went off about subjective value and uh, like the layman summarization of a few of your talks uh, this evening. But when they hear about Austrian economics, they're kind of put off by it, though they agree with it. What would you say that the solution to that initial uh, libertarianism sort of reaction is. So the question is, your mother is put off with... Yeah, okay. I, I think it's actually really sad that Austrian economics and libertarianism, that the, there's yeah. no clear distinction between the two. Uh, and I try to have a very clear distinction. So when I talk about Austrian economics, I do not talk about, well, I do not say, screw the government, even though I would really like to. <laughs> but instead, I talk about the economics, and then it, and I put on a different hat, and I talk about libertarianism. So I think we can do our, ourselves a big favor by separating the two. Because yes, Austrian economics is free market economics, but you have to start with a free market in order to see the, the impact of regulations. Right? So it's a theoretical tool, but it's not a normative tool. I mean, that's. I'm not sure I can go farther than that. All right, thank you. Um, uh, we have to stop the, the panel now, and uh, at 5.45, buses will pick you up in the front. If anyone has any questions, David Gordon will remain behind, so you can <laughs> ask. <laughs>